Well, good morning. Good morning. morning. Welcome to our service this morning at Christ Presbyterian. And uh, just one little uh, announcement. When we get down to the hymn of response to the sermon uh, in your order of worship, uh, we are singing the words to 495, uh, which is a un- kind of an unknown tune. So wherever I found this song online, it was, it was sung to the tune of And Can It Be, which is 431. So we're gonna sing the words to 495, but we'll sing the tune to And Can It Be. I, I think you can do it. Uh, you're, you're, you're a good singing church. Uh, I think you're able to do that. This morning we're talking about the riches and uh, talking Jesus' teaching on riches. So all of our elements of worship will revolve around riches, both um, right and wrong use of riches. So we'll be talking about those in all the elements of our worship. Let us begin with the silent time of prayer and preparation. Amen. And now, brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, as we've gathered together here this morning for the express purpose of worshiping our God and glorifying Him, as you come into His presence as His representative, it is my joy to wish you grace and mercy and peace from God our Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Could we please rise together as the Lord calls us to worship this morning? From Psalm 24, verses 7 through 10. Here is God's word. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, ye ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your head, O gate, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Let us pray. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come to you this day thanking you for this opportunity we have to gather together to honor and worship you. Lord, this is the day that you have made, and we will rejoice in it and be glad in it. We praise you, Lord, for the rain that you have given, Lord, to uh, come upon our dusty ground. We thank you, God, that you have given this as a blessing to us, and we praise you for it. We praise you also for this day, this day that you have given to us as a day to honor and to praise and to worship you. We pray, God, indeed, that you would bless our gathering as we come together as your corporate body to honor you. For we know that you have told us wherever two or three are gathered together in your name, there you are in the midst of them. And so, Lord, we are here for the express purpose of worshiping and honoring you. And we pray, God, again, that you would bless our gathering with your presence that you would touch each life that comes, that you would use the ministry of the word to speak to the hearts of people, to edification, exhortation, and comfort, O God. And we pray, Lord, that in all things you would be glorified, that Christ would be glorified, and that, Lord, the gospel of Christ may be known to your people. We pray all of these things now, for we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Our opening hymn and Trinity Psalter hymno, the ones in your racks there are, is number 24B, 24B.
Amen. If you remain standing and turn to the back of your hymn book and go to page 852, we'll find there the words of the Nicene Creed that we will be confessing together. Page 852, as we confess again with the saints throughout the ages of our beliefs, I will ask you now, brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, what do you believe? I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men, for our salvation, came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. This morning we will hear God's law. We will hear it from the first giving of the law in the book of Exodus chapter 20. I will be reading verses 1 through 17. Here again is God's own word. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, his male servant or his female servant, his ox or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. As ends the reading of God's law, let us now take some time in time of silent confession, and then I will lead us in a public prayer of confession.
And now our Father who are in heaven, we come to you, Lord, as we have come to confess our sins before you, to tell you of our deeds, of our words, of our thoughts, the things that we have not, that we should not have said, that we said, the things that we should not have done, that we did. And Lord, the words that we spoke that we shouldn't have. And Lord, the things that we ought to have done as well. But we come to you, Lord, because you have said that you are a forgiving God who shows steadfast love to those thousands of those who love you and keep your commandments. Lord, we would confess we have not kept your commandments perfectly. But Lord, yet you have put within us the law of God that desires and makes us desire to live righteous and holy in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. And so, Lord, we thank you that you have put your law within us and that, Lord, when we fail, we know we have failed because your Holy Spirit speaks to us through that law. And so, Lord, we thank you that we can know what we have done and be aware of our sins. But we come before you this morning confessing them and asking you to cleanse us from them, Lord, to forgive us as you promised, Lord. And we thank you, God, that there is none that is a pardoning God as you. And so, Lord, again, pardon us, forgive us, hear our prayers. And, Lord, we pray that you would help us in the week to come, that we would live, Lord, righteously and walk before you, God, as you would have your people to walk. We pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. Our words of pardon this morning come to us from the New Testament book of Ephesians, chapter 1. Paul speaking, verses 6 through 8. Here is God's word. To the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. Brothers and sisters, trust in that grace that God has lavished upon us, the riches of his grace. Believe in that and accept the fact that God has said he has pardoned our sins through his word. As a response, let us stand together and sing number 226 in Trinity Psalter hymnal. seated. This is our practice. We will now go to the Lord with our prayer request and uh, lift up our intercessions unto him. Let us pray. Lord, you are the God of all riches. You are the God who bestows lavishly upon your people your grace, Lord, which we need so desperately. Lord, you give us that grace to help in time of need as we come before your throne of mercy, O God. Lord, bringing to you our request. And we come, Lord, first of all, with our praises and our thanksgiving for you, for all that you have done for us. We thank you for, again, the rain that we are hearing even now, Lord, that you are bringing upon our ground. We thank you, God, for the food and the harvest that has been so abundant, Lord. We thank you that you provide for us all of our needs, Lord, day by day. 
And we thank you, God, for giving to us so many different blessings, not only material blessings, which we partake of, but also spiritual blessings, which we receive through you as well and through your Son and through his atonement. And so, Lord, we thank you for all of these things. We praise you for our preservation. We thank you, God, for your providence in our lives. And we thank you for all of the good things that you do for us and the things, Lord, even that we would say are not good, but Lord, yet they are good because you do them for us and give them to us, Lord. And we thank you for all of those things. We come to you this morning, Lord, with our needs and with our thanksgiving. We thank you, Lord, as we have this past week laid to rest one Lord who has been a part of this body of believers for many, many years. And Lord, we thank you for her testimony. And we thank you, God, for Lord, what she has meant to many of the people that are here. And we pray, God, you would continue to, com uh, to comfort those, Lord, of her family, those of friends that are still mourning or passing. And we ask you, Lord, to be with them. We pray, O oh God, for the rulers of this world, Lord. So we'll look tonight at your scriptures where it talks about a ruler that judges and right, rules justly, Lord. We, we would confess, Lord, that our rulers don't always rule justly, and they don't always rule righteously. And so, Lord, we pray for them. We pray that you would open their eyes to the wonders and glories of ruling in a righteous way, that they would see the blessings that can come upon a nation that will worship you and will serve you rightly. And I pray, God, that you would give them understanding, Lord. Help them to know why they should rule the way that they should, Lord, that they would understand the blessings that will come upon us if we do that. Give them wisdom, Lord. We pray for kings and all that are in authority, Lord. We pray, God, that you would give them that wisdom that they might indeed rule justly. We pray, Lord, also for our brothers and sisters across this world, Lord, that are in an area where they are being persecuted for their faith and for God, their belief. We pray for them, Lord. We thank you, God, for those that are willing to stand for you in a time when there are those that are ruling their nations, that are causing those that worship you to be imprisoned and even put to death. Lord, we thank you for the faithfulness of our brothers and sisters who are, Lord, enduring that, and we pray for them. Them. And we pray, God, that you would keep them strong in the hour of persecution, in the hour of trouble, Lord, that they may be strong and may be able to confess you, Lord, and not deny you. And we thank you for them, God. And we thank you for what they are doing. And we thank you at the same time for the freedom you have given us to come together and to honor and to worship you, Lord, without fear that we are going to be uh, put upon by the authorities and taken off to prison. But we thank you, God, that we are able to worship you in peace. And we pray that that may continue, Lord. Father, we come to you with our needs this morning as well. We think about our missionaries, Lord, both home and abroad. We thank you, O oh God, for the uh, for our brother who uh, ministers in Wildwood, New Jersey, Lord. We thank you, God, again, for the summer uh, of uh, ministry there has been there at the Boardwalk Chapel, Lord, which has gone on for many, many years. We thank you for those throughout the churches who have sent uh, young people as well as those who are older, Lord, to the chapel uh, to share with people on the boardwalk. And we thank you, God, for the hundreds of people, Lord, who receive Bibles and Gospels of John. We pray, Lord, that you would use that to open up their heart to your gospel, that they may understand you. And we thank you for it, Lord. And God, we pray for the new call that you have put upon our brother, Lord, and you would help him in the new uh, works that he will be working with in, uh, uh, in that area, in New Jersey, in uh, uh, Puerto Rico, Lord, and all of those places. We lift them, Lord, and ask that you would help him as he ministers to the churches there. We also pray, Lord, again for our foreign missionaries, Lord. And again, we thank you, Lord, for our missionary in Asia. 
uh, who is now celebrating 30 years of service in his current location. Lord, I thank you for our brother and his wife and family, Lord. I thank you for the privilege we had to serve with him for several months. And Lord, I pray, God, that you would bless his ministry, Lord. I pray, Lord, as he uh, has kind of a change a little bit going on, I pray, Lord, that everything would go well, and I pray that you would use him. And God, we thank you for the presbytery that has been established there in that country, Lord. And we pray for those that are hearing the gospel there, Lord, that they would respond to it. We pray also, Lord, for our missionaries there in Uruguay, as very soon we will have a, a brother and sister who will come to us and minister to us here in this church. We're also a part of that ministry in Uruguay, Lord. And we pray for those that are still there as they uh, continue to work there, Lord, those associates, uh, and teaching them how to do the audio and other things in the sound system, Lord, and also for their social media outreach and Sunday school, and many of the other things uh, that are taking place. Lord, we thank you, God, for our missionaries there. And we praise you, Lord, as in recent years we've been able to have this work. And we ask, Lord, you continue to add souls to the church there, Lord, and bless them. And Lord, as they lose a missionary couple that has been with them uh, for a long time, we pray that you would help them, Lord, uh, to in that time, I'm sure, of, of missing, that you would help them, Lord, to be able to endure. And we lift them to you. We pray again for our brothers and sisters here in our body who have health issues. We think of one of our members' husband who again is going through a different uh, drug right now for her, his cancer, Lord. And we pray, oh God, as there's been changes in his life and his body in the last a few weeks, Lord, we pray, God, that you would be with him. And above all, we pray, God, that you would soften his heart to the gospel of Christ. Lord, he knows it, he's heard it. And we pray, God, that you would just continue to speak to his heart and we lift him unto you. We pray also for our sister who was supposed to have been done by this time with the hip surgery, but in your providence it has been that she uh, it will be delayed, Lord, and maybe even into December, but we pray if possible that there would be a possibility of it happening before then, O oh Lord. And we thank you, uh, God, that uh, this is able to be done. We thank you for our brother who is recovering from hip, hip surgery and doing very, very well. We pray the same for our sister when she goes through this. We also pray for our other member who is scheduled for surgery coming up very quickly on October 2nd. We pray for her. We pray for her womb. We pray, Lord, for uh, the surgery that will go on, that you'll give the surgeons wisdom as they deal with this, Lord. We pray that everything would go well. We pray, God, that the, uh, what needs to be there will be there. And we just pray, God, that you would help her in her recovery. We pray for a quick recovery, Lord, and that you'd bless their home during that time. And we lift them to you, Lord. Lord. We also, uh, Lord, can, as we've prayed, continue to pray for the family that is mourning. We pray, Lord, for our brother who the word is now that he is returning from the Red Sea, that he is coming back to San Diego. Lord, we are thankful for hearing our prayers and Lord, indeed, bringing him back for that. We pray, Lord, for wisdom, for our session, with the many things we're dealing with right now, and not only for them, Lord, but for our pastoral search committee, and still there are uh, much to be done there. We pray for wisdom there. We pray for those mothers here in our congregation that are carrying uh, little ones in their womb, Lord. We thank you, God, for providing life and giving them and blessing them with the fruit of their womb. We pray that you would continue to be with them, to protect them, protect the child, and protect them through delivery, Lord, and beyond. And we lift them unto you, Lord. And finally, again, Lord, we pray for our member who is going through trial, Lord, for some things. Uh, Lord, we pray, God, that you would help the courts as they rule. And we pray for our brother that he would come to a total understanding of what he has done and repent from it, Lord, and turn, Lord, to you in grace. And, Lord, we lift him unto you. Lord, we lift all of these needs to you this morning. We pray, God, that you would hear our prayers and answer them. And now, as the body of believers, we come to you to pray in the way that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. If we could stand together again once more in Trinity Psalter hymnal, page number 446. Please remain standing as we look at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16. I will be reading the first 13 verses. I'm actually only going to uh, cover through verse 9, but I'll read through verse 13. Here is God's Word. Jesus also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that the man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Turn in your account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I'm removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill, and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. 
And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in a very little is dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been uh, faithful in that which is another, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Thus we will end the reading of God's word. Please be seated. Let us pray. And now, Lord, as we look at this passage of Scripture this morning that deals with wealth and riches and wisdom, I pray, God, that you would guide me and direct me. Lord, it is a passage that has been the subject of much different comment through time. But I pray, God, that uh, in, in your will, Lord, that I would be able to present that which would indeed teach edification to your people from this passage. Lord, we ask your, you for your help. And we pray, God, you would bless this service and bless this word to the hearts of your people. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. So we have left chapter 15 with the parable of the three lost things, the, uh, that, uh, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. But we continue on with the teachings of Jesus, and it begins here in chapter 16 in the first four verses with what appears to be a parable. It seems like the chapter here in Luke begins with a parable and ends with a parable, but neither one of the stories are actually identified as a parable uh, as others were before. Uh, perhaps the story at the end of this chapter is the one that is most debated uh, because if, if it is a parable, it is the only parable where Jesus actually gives a name in the parable. The person's name, Lazarus, is actually mentioned in that. And uh, so the question is, well, why does he put a name in there? Why doesn't he just say a poor man? But we'll get to that one later. But even uh, here at the beginning of this chapter, this is not called a parable. Is it possible that Jesus is actually telling a story that actually happened, a true story that that is possible? It could be that or it could be a parable as well. And uh, it's interesting that both stories, the one here at the beginning of the chapter and the one at the end, begin with the exact same words, there was a rich man. Uh, both of the stories begin with that. In fact, Luke tells six different parables, or as Jesus tells the parables, about a rich man. And uh, I told you uh, that last week the st uh, story of the parable we looked at was often referred to as the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, the parable in our verses this morning, again, if it is a parable, is often referred to or usually referred to as the parable of the dishonest steward. But there are others who call it the parable of the shrewd manager. So there are two different ways of looking at this and that will play into how we look at it as we look at this story as well. Luke has told other stories about a manager or a steward of the house. In chapter 12 and verse 39, he talks about the master of the house not knowing what time his master would return. And uh, he tells, talks about that there. In uh, chapter 14, we read about the master of the house who prepares a great banquet and sends out invitations to many people. And so here again, we have another master of the house uh, story that uh, Luke tells to us that Christ has given, of course, first. Now we've had some tough sledding in the passages we've looked at up to this point, uh, but some would say we are coming to perhaps the most difficult passage in the Gospel of Luke. One writer actually lists 175 books and articles that he found that are written upon this passage, many of them with probably different takes upon this particular subject. I'll elaborate on that a little bit more. Uh, a little later. But the parable begins, or the story begins, with a master praise, uh, uh, with the master um, praising 
Or first of all, I should say that the master firing a steward for dishonesty, which you can assent to, we can say, yeah, a guy should be fired for being dishonest. But then we have the master, first of all, he fires him for dishonesty, and then he praises him at the end for a greater act of dishonesty. That's where the problem seems to come in at that time. A couple of weeks ago, I pointed out that, that in these chapters, Luke goes back and forth between Jesus addressing the Pharisees and Jesus addressing the disciples. And uh, I pointed out to you how there's several, this, this goes all the way through Luke here, where first he's addressing the Pharisees and then the, the disciples and all of that. Well, the last chapter he was addressing the Pharisees, but verse 1 tells us he's now switching and he's now addressing the disciples, uh, which could mean just the 12 that are following him or could refer to others that are following him as disciples at that time. So the rich man has a steward, or is a King James, or excuse me, the King James is steward. The ESV says a manager. Now, is this man a slave? That is debated as well, because oftentimes uh, there would be slaves in the household that would do that. And slaves in the Bible were much better off. The, the problem, we always think of slavery, we think about it in 1800s America and, and the horror of that slavery. Slaves in the Bible were much better off than the slaves during that time in our country's history. And um, even though they, they're, more, uh, they're, they're better off uh, than, they, I guess, they would be to the ones we had, but nevertheless, Still, it, it doesn't seem like this man would be a slave. It appears that he's better than that uh, as far as um, his position and what he has. And also the fact would be that at the end of the story, he's let go by the manager, which would not be what you would do to a slave uh, in, in those days. Even though they were better off, you wouldn't just let the slave go. But the rich man hears in some way, whatever it is, that this steward is now wasting the master's possessions. And that word wasting is the word we had earlier in the parable of the prodigal son. Remember, he went into a far country and wasted his substance. Well, now we have another parable involving wasting, and the man is, is wasting his master's substance. So in verse 2, the rich man calls the steward and tells him he now has to give an account of his management and then leave his employee. So he's basically turning in the books that he has had. And uh, apparently, the steward has mismanaged two things. He has, number one, mismanaged his master's account, uh, which the master's heard. But secondly, because the master heard about it, he has also mismanaged his reputation. And uh, he has done that as well. And uh, so the man is, in our parlance, he is fired. I was thinking about that this past week as I was uh, preparing this message, and I thought, have I ever been fired from a job? I was try trying to remember, and I asked my wife too. I said, was I ever fired from a job? And, and um, she couldn't remember one, and I couldn't remember one either. But I, I thought of one that involved the firing that I was involved in, and I was remembering that. And uh, when I was a very, very young man, my sister got me a job at the local Holiday Inn. And I was working with two other guys uh, that were cleaning the restaurants at night. So there were two restaurants in the Holiday Inn, we and we were responsible to clean both those restaurants overnight. And uh, one night, uh, both of the other guys called in sick. So I was left alone to do it. The next day, the boss came in and he said to me, hey, the place has never looked better. He fired one of the guys, and, uh, and the other guy gave another job, and he gave me a quarter an hour raise, which even in those days wasn't that great, I can tell you that. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, even, even with that, and firing the two, I still had time for like at least an hour every night to climb up on the stainless steel table and take a nap. Uh, so um, so I, I wasn't that great. So, uh, but anyway, uh, this guy in our story gets fired. So the manager who is being fired now faces a decision. What do I do now? He says he's not strong enough for manual labor and he'd be too ashamed to beg. The apocryphal book, not the book of Ecclesiastes, but the apocryphal book of Ecclesiasticus says it is better uh, to die than to beg. It's better to die than to beg. The one option he doesn't do is he doesn't say, I know what I can do, I'll defend myself of my reputation. 
He doesn't do that, which indicates to us strongly that the man is indeed guilty of what the master is saying. But you notice the phrase that he says here. It says, he says, within himself. That's very similar, again, to what the prodigal did. Remember the prodigal, it says he came to himself in that passage. So both the prodigal and this man, they both come to themselves. They, re they recognize something uh, here about what they can do. And Luke actually uses that phrase uh, at least um, a half, at least, excuse me, a, a dozen times. He uses it to refer to someone who comes to himself, who all of a sudden, it's like a reasoning within themselves, and then they come to some course of action. So like I say, Luke has that at least 12 times that we do, and we, and we understand what that is, because we, we have conversations with ourselves sometimes, too. maybe not out loud, uh, but we have conversations. We talk about what, well, maybe I should do this, maybe I should do that, and so uh, we have that. Remember the, the uh, rich man back in chapter 12, he, he says, he thought within himself, and he said, what am I gonna do, and he thought, Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger barns. And, and so he needs to figure out a way to make people indebted. The steward does, indebted to him. So when he leaves his current position, he's going to have somewhere to live. Now, um, there are those that write on this, and, and I was talking with one of our elders before the service who told me he was reading the commentaries before on the passage, which I was very excited about, but uh, we're ta talking about that, and um, there are, um, excuse me, I just, just lost my complete train of thought there. Oh, yeah, the idea was, of the different commentaries, was that uh, if, if it was really embezzlement or fraud that he was doing, the master would have just fired him outright, not, not given him time like that. I, I don't know if that's, that's true or not. And uh, verse 4 says in the ESV, I have decided what to do. Now, I know in the, in the original Bible, in the Greek, there is no punctuation in the Greek, so I, I understand that. Uh, but what the Good News Bible does here is, I think, is right. It puts an exclamation point in it, because that's what this word indicates. It's, it's like he says, he's thinking about it in himself, and, goes, and he goes, ah! It's like in the cartoons where the light bulb comes on over the head. That, that's what's going on here. And, and uh, one uh, commentator translates it, I've got it. I might translate it, Eureka. He, he comes up with this plan. He's got an idea that'll give him security for a long time. So we'll look uh, forward to verses five through eight. And so the steward begins calling all of those who are in debt to his master. Uh, it's very likely, we don't know, but it's very likely that the um, man that was the rich man here was a landowner and he was renting out his property and his land to people uh, for various causes and then whatever uh, they brought in as a result of that land, they would owe a certain percentage uh, to the rich man. And uh, so the steward calls these people in, uh, those who have been renting, and asks what exactly do they owe to the master. And it's interesting, he says, what do you owe to my master? So he's given the indication that even though he's been fired, that he's still, he's still in the employ of the master because he says, what, what do you owe my master? So the first man comes in and says, I, I owe 100 measures of oil, which really doesn't mean anything to us, does it? We don't really know what that means. Um, commentators put it close to 1,000 gallons of oil. Now, probably wasn't fuel oil, uh, but a thousand uh, gallons of oil, which is quite an amount. And he tells him to come down quickly. I, again, he wants these transactions to be done quickly before his master comes back. And he tells him, if you owe a thousand, he said, put down 500, but you only owe 500 at this time. Now, whether or not these renters know that they are involved in fraud, we don't know. Maybe, maybe they thought this is what the master told the guy. Uh, you know, forgive these people, give, give them a break. Maybe, maybe that's what they're doing, but we don't know. Um, K.E. Bailey, one of the commentators, argues uh, that they didn't know that, but assumed simply that the master had changed his mind. But myself, I kind of, I don't know, I, I think they, they were taking advantage of something they might have known was a little dishonest. So then comes another man in, in verse seven, and this man owes a hundred measures of wheat, translated into our language, a thousand bushels of wheat. And the steward tells him to sit down and to write 80. Now again, why does he get a 20% reduction? The first guy gets a 50% reduction. We don't know, but that isn't given to us in the parable. 
But verse 8 is where the real question comes in. The first problem begins with the phrase in the ESV, the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. Now, that's the ESV. I think the King James is better here. The King James says, and the Lord commended the unjust steward. The word Lord here is the common Greek word for Lord, kurios. It's, it's found many, many times in the New Testament and almost always refers to Jesus or God, the Father. It, it, one or the other it refers to that. So who is doing the commending here? Is it the master in the parable or is it the Lord Jesus who is actually commending the steward? Now, in verse 8, the steward is clearly identified as dishonest in the ESV or unjust in the King James or in the most tr literal translation, unrighteous. This is the same Greek word that is found in Romans 1.18, which says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. There, the Greek word is found twice referring to the wrath of God that comes upon the unrighteous. So here is a man clearly identified to us as being opposed to God's law, who is praised by either the master in the parable or praised by Jesus himself. That doesn't seem quite right, does it? One respected writer who talks about how difficult this passage is, is J.C. Ryle. He writes, the passage we have now read is a difficult one. There are knots in it which perhaps will never be untied until the Lord comes again. So whether you say the master in verse 8 is the master of the story or it is Jesus, we still have the same issue. Why should someone who is obviously, by, dis, by, by description, is said to be unrighteous, why should the Lord, or even the master in the parable, commend such a person? Now, I will say that the majority of the people that I consulted believe the master in verse eight is the master of the story and not Jesus. And it does seem more probable that Jesus concludes the parable in verse 8, and then he goes on to give his comment starting in verse 9. That does seem to be uh, the more likely. But still the question remains, why praise this unrighteous steward? Now, there are those who try to come up with some ingenious solutions, and of course, they write articles, and they get published, and all of that. And one, one idea that's been put out there is that by the steward doing what he does, by having people reduce their debt, he is presenting the master as a wonderful man. And the, the man's reputation is growing exponentially. And, uh, and so therefore what the steward is doing is a great thing for the master. And he's certainly not going to come and say, oh, now that it's been reduced this much, let's put it back up. He's not going to do that. And, and so uh, therefore people will love the master, so therefore the steward is doing a great thing uh, for that. But the problem here is then the debtors would have to believe something that's never told them, that it's the master's idea to reduce that debt. That's not told uh, that what they did. Another idea that's suggested is perhaps what the master is doing here is actually charging interest on the debt that is owed, which is forbidden by the law of God. You're not supposed to do that. Deuteronomy 23.19 says, you shall not charge interest on loans to your brother, interest on money, interest on food, interest on anything that is lent for interest. So if the master uh, is charging interest, then people say what the steward does is keeping his master legal according to the law of God. And so he's actually doing uh, a good thing. Well, if that's the case, why are we calling the steward unrighteous? <laughs> In that case, wouldn't he be the righteous steward if that's what he's trying to do? It appears to me that all the ideas trying to make the steward into a hero actually fall flat. But let's make one thing perfectly clear, as a former president used to say. The steward in this parable is praised for one thing, 
and one thing only. He's not praised for his dishonesty. He's not praised for any of that. He's only praised for one thing. He's praised for, as the ESV calls it, his shrewdness. This Greek word for shrewdness is only found here in the New Testament. However, there are other forms of this word as an adjective and where it's found more often. It is the adjective that describes the builder in Matthew 7 who builds his house upon the rock. He is called shrewd or wise in that story as well. It is used of the story of the virgins where there were five foolish, but there were five that were shrewd virgins as well. And so we find it there. This isn't the normal Greek word for wisdom that we think of, which is sophos, which is uh, where we get our word sophisticated and sophomore, although why we associate 10th grade students with wisdom, I'm not entirely sure. But anyway, uh, but is this passage really that difficult, as Ryle and others seem to say? There's a writer by the name of F.W. Danker, and I have no idea who he is, but he says he is surprised that this comment has caused such perplexity. And he goes on to call this perplexity one of the curiosities in the history of interpretation. Because we're not going to argue that what the steward did is stupid, are we? We're not going to say, well, that, 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 that's wrong. I mean, it, the guy's stupid. We're not going to argue that way. We're going to admit that what the guy did was very, very wise. He did a wise thing. And, and so, you know, you don't have to approve of a deed to admire perhaps the wisdom that brought about. Sometimes you, you hear about an illegal act and you don't commend it, but then you hear about the planning that went into it and how it was done. And uh, you think, well, yeah, that was pretty good. Uh, yeah, wow, uh, that took a little bit of thought to come up with that. Now here, I go, uh, here again I'm gonna go as a grandpa because I turned 70 this past week. Um, I, can, I can now talk about grandpa, tell stories when I was a kid. And um, anyway, uh, I, was, I don't remember exactly how old, fairly young, I know it's in elementary school, but I don't remember. Uh, what year it was, but anyway, I was with my cousins and we went to a gas station. Now here I'm gonna tell something that, again, this is for the younger people here who you never would hear of this, you can't believe this, but here we go, when, when I was a kid. But when I was a kid, you could go to a pop, you could go to a pop machine and you could put a dime in and you could pull out a glass bottle of Coke. And, and you could do, and then you'd drink it, and then, and then they'd have a little case by that bop machine. It was supposed to put the bottle back in, and, and you could do that. Well, we, we had that, and, and we, what we discovered as kids, I don't know how we discovered it, was you don't have to put the dime in in this one. And oh man, did we start drinking pop? And we'd go up, you know, and pretend like we're putting a dime in and pull a bottle out and do all of that. And, and uh, well, uh, I, again, that, I, I still feel guilty about doing that because uh, I never did uh, reimburse the owner of that gas station. I, I do think the statute of limitations has ran out on it, so I think I'm safe. But I could, I could ask the lawyers here tonight, uh, today, to see if I'm all right with that. Um, but, but anyway, uh, sometimes you know you watch a movie and it, it's a good con movie or a good heist movie, and and even though you don't like the fact that it's dishonest and that they're they're bilking somebody uh, out of their money in regards to that you still kind of admire what they did. I, I watched a movie several years ago where these guys robbed a bank and one of the guys at the end stayed behind with the money and, and then actually waited till the, like the next day when the bank opened and walked out with, with the money. And I thought, well, that's, that was clever uh, in doing that. I, I think about the old movie, The Sting, and I think about all that went into that plan and, uh, and all of that. Well, our steward has a cunning plan and we can admire the plan and still condemn the unrighteousness of the act. We can do that. But this isn't the only person in the Bible who acted in a sense unjustly, but yet wisely and, and was commended or rewarded for it. You might think about Tamar. We certainly wouldn't um, approve of her actions to what Tamar did, but even Judah in the story proclaims that she is more righteous than he was in what she did. Rahab the prostitute lied, used dishonesty, 
but yet she was rewarded, her and her household, for the dishonesty and what they did. At the end of chapter 12 of Genesis, Abraham gives up his wife to Pharaoh, and as a result, he becomes a wealthy man. And there's other parts and places in the Bible where, where people would say, well, they acted wisely, but not really righteously. So we could summarize maybe what Jesus is saying in this way. As sinners are very wise in securing the things that relate to this present life, so we as believers should be wise in securing the things that relate to the world and the life to come. So let me move to that verse, verse 9, before I, I give application this morning. The first, this, this verse was a little difficult. I, I read it several times, and then I read what people said about it. The first part, part of the verse, the ESV translates, I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth. The contemporary English version says, I tell you, use wicked wealth to make friends for yourselves. The NIV, probably the most clear, says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves. Money by itself is neither good nor evil. It is how it is used. But it is interesting that the word actually used here in verse 9 is the word mammon. I wonder if I were to ask you, and I, I'm going to ask you, but I wonder what you'd say, and you don't have to shout it out, but you can think about it in your head. How many times the word mammon is found in the New Testament? I wonder how many times you'd think that would be. You can come up with a number in your head right now. It actually appears a total of four times in the New Testament. And three of those times are right here. Okay, Outside of right here in this passage that I read to you this morning, the only other place the word is found is Matthew 6, 24. No man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. The interesting thing about the word mammon, at least to me and I hope to you, is that it comes from the word aman, which is where we get our word amen. So when you say amen to something, what are you saying? You're saying it is assuredly so. It is true what you have said. Amen means it is true. You have said right. We, we are confident in what you have said. And so mammon is spoken of that which gives a confidence but it is a false confidence to what it gives. The steward in the parable used the wealth to make himself new friends. And Jesus is saying we should use our wealth to gain heavenly rewards. Similar to what Jesus says in Luke 12, 33 and 34, sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Or Luke 14, 13 and 14, but when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. The last part of the verse is probably better translated that you may be received into eternal dwellings, which again is how the NIV translates it. And I'll come back to that. As I was going over this message last night and printing off the pages, it dawned on me that this is a good message, I think, to go along with what our Sunday school speaker will be dealing with this morning. I, th I think uh, the passage here goes right along with that. And so I want to make some applications concerning that. As I said, Jesus expresses admiration at, of the wisdom of the steward, which causes some people problems. But you know what? We can admire people that aren't godly. I do. I admire people that are one, one of the people, if you say who are some of your heroes or who would you list as someone that you really admire? The first person I think of, I mean, outside of the Bible and all that, but the first person I think about is not as far as I know a believer and that's Winston Churchill. And that's, that's who I would think right away. You know, the old joke is Mussolini did terrible things, but at least he got the trains to run on time, right? And, and, and so we, we, we admire people who aren't necessarily godly or righteous, but we, we do admire them. A couple years ago, my wife and I were privileged to go through the Reagan Museum in California, Presidential Museum. 
And as I went through it, I thought, I forgot how many good things happened during those years. There were so many good things that took place, and I had forgotten about them. And, and I'm not sure if President Reagan was a believer. I know he professed it. I, I can't tell you 100% that he was, but I still admire him for what he did. One of the things, as I went through that museum, that I'd forgotten about was, not, not, I didn't forget about the assassination, but if you remember the, he was assassinated, or attempted to be assassinated, and he was shot at, and uh, I, I didn't know how, actually how serious it was and how close he was to death. I, I, I didn't know that. I found that out there that it was very, very touch and go as far as that. But I, I, I love what he said as he was going into surgery to the doctors. He said, I just hope you're all Republicans. <laughs> he said, and the doctor said, Mr. President, today we're all Republicans. And uh, so there's a lot of good things and a lot of things we can respect. We, we can respect the steward for, not for his dishonesty, but for his cunning. It's okay to respect people that aren't necessarily godly or believers in some way. Our Lord says in verse 8, the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. He doesn't say that they're out and out more shrewd than the godly. He says they're just more shrewd in dealing with their own in this, in this world. They're, they're better in dealing with that. The children of the world are more shrewd in worldly things, which is why when it comes to the things of the world, the world does it better. You know, the church is always trying to, well, this is what the world is doing, right? You know, this is how they attract people. We're going to do it. The world does that great, but we don't. So we should leave that to the world. We should do the things we do well. And, and, and we should not try to copy what, what that, well, this brings people to the concerts and sporting events and all that. And, and no, that, that isn't the way we should act. But the big question we need to ask ourselves out of this story is, how do we use our wealth? Someone wrote, the only difference between men and boys is that men buy more expensive toys. Uh, didn't even hear amen from the ladies. But um, anyway, so Henry Thoreau wrote, of course, that a man is wealthy uh, in proportion to the number of things he can do without. So of course, there are bad ways or not so good ways to use our wealth. But the question that the story presents to us is, are we using our wealth to make eternal friends? I think we can lose focus in our lives or lose what's going on with our money. And so I want to present that to you this morning. You give money in the offering, like the one we're going to take here in just a little bit. The church takes that money and puts it into support of different things, including foreign missions and home missions. These missionaries in turn preach the gospel where they're at, whether it's a foreign or at home location. And as a result of that, people come to faith in Christ. You have used your wealth to make friends in eternity. You have used it in that way. And in some day, when we pass from this life, as our dear sister Karen has done this past week, there will be those waiting on the other side to welcome us into the habitation because we invested our money into that which was used as a means to bring them into the eternal kingdom. Don't you want to be a part of that? I think that's exciting to think about that. Probably most of us at some point in our life have gotten involved with what we call a get-rich-quick scheme. We put our money into something that we are told is going to reap great rewards and we're going to become rich very quickly. I did it in penny stocks. And I'm not preaching against stocks, but the penny stocks didn't do so well. My other stocks have done well, but penny stocks didn't do good. But in those days, I thought, I'm going to, you know, I'm buying these stocks at three cents a share, and they're going to come up to a dollar a share, and I'm going to be rich. And I had bought, I heard a guy on the radio, and I, he talked about the stock, and thought, oh, it sounds really good. So I bought it at a, a thousand shares at a dollar a share, and that was a lot of money for me in those days. But, but I put, invested a thousand dollars in it. And I woke up one morning, and I looked at the stock pages, and it said it was five dollars a share. I called my broker excited, I said, should I sell them, should I sell them? I mean, and, and he said, oh, no, it's going to go a lot higher. Yeah. That was the last time I trusted a broker. Sorry, that's a, <laughs> But again, you know, we, we think about these schemes. Proverbs, I should have listened to, 2820, a faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who hastens to be rich 
will not go unpunished. What our Lord is talking about here is a guaranteed return, not a possibility, a hundred percent guarantee that we will reap eternal rewards. Now I know it's not all about money. I understand that. And I understand there's other things in life. But we have to think about it. It is part of it. And so we think, how wise are we in the use of the mammon of unrighteousness? Ambrose said, the bosoms of the poor, the houses of widows, the mouths of children are the barns which last forever. Kent Hughes in his commentary asks, is our use of our money bringing us closer to God? Have we used our wealth and possessions to gain eternal friends? A man you may have heard of by the name of Martin Luther said this, therefore we must use all things upon earth in no other way than as a guest who travels through the land and comes to a hotel where he must lodge overnight. He takes only food and lodging from the host and he says not that the property of the host belongs to him. Just so should we also treat our temporal possessions as if they were not ours and enjoy only so much of them as will nourish the body and then help our neighbors with the balance. Thus the life of the Christian is only a lodging for the night. Since we have no continuing city, we must journey to heaven where the Father is. It's really the same principle we've been talking about in Sunday school the last couple of weeks, the parable of the sheep and the goats and investing ourselves in people's lives. The last thing I want to say is the unjust steward is commended because he devises a plan to make sure he'll have a place to live till the day he dies. The question is why don't we use the same effort and ingenuity to pray for ourselves eternal habitations as Jesus refers to it in verse nine. If there is a place called heaven, and there is, and if there is, and it is an eternal dwelling place, and it is, how dumb must a person be not to want to prepare themselves for that? It makes no sense whatsoever. We either have to convince ourselves there really is no such place, or that somehow we're gonna make it in. But here's where what makes most people who don't prepare for that even dumber, if I can use that word. The way is exceedingly simple. It's not hard. The, the master didn't say we well, have to run a marathon. The Lord didn't say we well, have to lift 500 pound weights. You don't have to go out and do some stupendous work. All you have to do is trust in Christ, believe in him, confess in him, confess him as your Lord and Savior, lay yourself at his feet and, and ask to be used of him. And, and, and it's, it's not of anything that you do in order to do it. Augustine said, why did the Lord Jesus Christ present this parable to us? He surely did not approve of the cheat of the servant who cheated his master, stole from him, and didn't make it up from his own pocket. On top of that, he also did some extra pilfering. He caused his master further loss in order to prepare a little nest of quiet and security for himself after he lost his job. Why did the Lord set this before us? It is not because the steward servant cheated, but because he exercised foresight for the future. When even a cheat is praised for his ingenuity, Christians who make no such provision blush. I mean, this is what he added, behold, the children of this age are more prudent than the children of light. They perpetuate frauds to secure their future. In what life, after all, uh, did that steward insure himself like that? What one was he going to quit when he bowed to his master's decision? He was insuring himself for a life that was going to end. Would you not insure yourself for eternal life? If we don't prepare ourselves for eternity, all we can do is shake our heads at you and say, I don't know what to say. It's not hard. It's just coming to Christ, trusting his atoning work. Give yourself to him. And that would be the exhortation I would leave you with this morning. Let's pray. Lord, we pray as we hear this parable and we think about it, and we think about how you praise the one 
the Lord, even though he did it dishonestly, he, he prepared himself wisely. He prepared himself for the future. And yet, Lord, there are those of us who don't do that. And Lord, as we think about our eternal destiny, how foolish it is for us to continue to live and not prepare ourselves for that. Because we don't even know if we're gonna be here in the next second. Our life is but a vapor, it's here and gone. And so, Lord, I pray that you would be with those, Lord, if there are those here who have never confessed you, Lord, they would come to you and lay themselves at your feet and trust in your atoning work for their salvation. And for those of us who have done it, Lord, may we also look at ourselves as we use the mammon of unrighteousness and think about how we use it, whether it's wise or not. And we pray, God, that you would guide us and direct us in that as well. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We ask your blessing upon your people in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. They mentioned we're going to sing this morning in response. The hymn is 495, but the tune is And Can It Be. So if you could turn to 495 for the words, and in your mind, remember the tune for And Can It Be.
please be seated. We only have one offering this morning for the needs of the church, so let us pray. Our God and Father, again, as we have just looked at, Lord, us dealing with the mammon of unrighteousness. Lord, so we offer it to you this morning. We give to you of our substance, Lord, that, Lord, indeed, there will be those who will be able to welcome us into our eternal habitation. Lord, people that we will never, ever meet in this earth, on this earth, we'll never meet them, Lord. But God, there will be those in the kingdom because partly of our giving. Of course, all glory goes to you, Lord, in the saving of souls. But God, you would use us and use our means. And so we pray you would bless this offering and that, Lord, even through it, there would be someone that this would be used to bring them into the kingdom. Bless it, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Please rise for the benediction, and then we'll sing as our doxology out of the blue book, number 40, more precious than silver. But brothers and sisters, now receive the Lord's benediction as you go. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance unto you and give you peace.